Hello everyone, good evening. Nice to see you all, thanks for joining um, tonight's Periscope. I'm not sure why there's a couple of love hearts coming in already because I'm sitting here in my gym gear with my hair unkempt, looking like a state. Um, but hey, this is the real me when I'm not on the TV. Um, and the reason why I look a bit like this is because, thank you for the nice comment about yesterday's FA Cup coverage, the reason why um, I look like this is because until about 10 minutes ago I was putting my daughter to bed and that involved trying to get her to clean her teeth and she then wants me to clean the teeth of the crab which is in the bath with her, not a real one and the Macapaca's teeth and Tinky Winky's teeth or whatever so um, I wasn't sure whether I'd even make it in time um, to do this Periscope chat but here I am um, and the reason for this Periscope chat, I've been talking about it on Twitter all day um, and I'm pleased that there's over 500 of you already rolling in for this, is I have seen loads of Periscopes um, and it's like, oh here I am walking down the street, here I am showing my boyfriend Periscope, here I am eating an ice cream and I thought what can we do to sort of make this something that's useful for you guys? Um, and one of the questions I get asked all the time, obviously with my job, how do I become a TV presenter? How do I get into TV? So I thought that I would just give you a bit of advice from me, really. And it's not going to be very long. It's going to be a few minutes. Um, and this is me in my study chatting to you about how to get a job in TV. I'm glad you like the coffee cup. Trust me. When you're a dad, you need a coffee. Right. So how to get a job in television. How to end up as a TV presenter. A bit of career advice for you guys. Because um, there's loads of you... Um, Always asking me questions on Twitter, how do you do it, how do you get into it. So let me give you my story. So I was doing my A-levels in 1999, and I went with my brother to collect my A-level results, and these were my results, right? E, N, U. E, N, U. Two points. No way that I was going to university. My mum was a teacher at the school. A few weeks after that, I got fired from McDonald's for having no communication skills, okay? We're only talking about the year 2000. We're only talking about 15 years ago. Fired from McDonald's, A-level failure. Back to school, redid my exams. And this is where a little bit of sort of fate comes into play really. The day that I returned to school, my politics teacher had a letter and he held it up and he said, look, if there's anyone here that would like to get involved in a local TV channel that's just starting up, go down and see them. And I thought, well, all my mates have gone to university, or they're having a gap year, they're having great fun. I'm sat in a class with a load of kids, because you know what it's like when you're at school, if they're a year below you, you just don't even speak to them, they're sort of little children. So I ended up in a position that was horrible, absolutely horrendous. And I was trying to work out how I could get out of this position. And the answer was, go to this local TV channel, chat to them, um, tell them that I wanted a job in TV, um, and that's how it came about. So I went down there, it was called Rapture TV. Does anyone here, does anyone watching this Periscope remember Rapture TV? I would imagine none of you remember Rapture TV. Um, so I ended up at Rapture TV. I don't know whether this thing's working still. If there's anyone there, just send me a quick message so I know that you're there. Because I see no messages coming up. Tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to sign out and sign back in again. Here we go. Hello. Yeah, I'm back. I'm so sorry about that. I don't know what went on there, whether it was my internet connection or whether it was my phone. Something went stupid. Okay, so where was I? Yeah, so we're in 1999 and I've failed my A-levels, right? Um, where do you go from there? You failed your A-levels, you've got fired from McDonald's, you need to get a job in television. So I ended up doing some work experience at a local TV channel called Rapture TV, and then from there, I ended up getting involved <coughs> in, um, I ended up getting involved in uh, a lo local TV channel that basically didn't do very much, um, apart from broadcast the odd show on cable TV back in the early 90s, but I knew at that point I really, really wanted to um, get involved in TV. And I don't know when the day happened, but I never really knew what I wanted to do at school. But then I remember the day arrived when I thought, I think I want to be on the telly. I started working at Rapture TV, and every time I got an opportunity to do a bit of presenting, I really enjoyed it. And this was the weird thing. Um, I They ran a competition for viewers to send in a home video, and the best home video got to present a show from Paris. But because they had no real viewers at home, 
they asked me and the other work experience kids to do it and um, I made a video and the producer picked me as the winner and while I was redoing my A-level exams I ended up going to Paris, my mum and dad didn't know about this by the way, I ended up going to Paris um, and hosting a live TV show for this channel Rapture TV which was brilliant. Um, and then one thing led to another and I now ended up at BT Sport. So. How did I end up at BT Sport from being on Rapture TV in Norwich in the middle of nowhere? Right, I've got a few tips for you. The first thing is hard work. I got the opportunity to hang out with John Watson the night before his final commentary at Euro 2008. And we sat there and I was having a beer and I was chatting to him about the commentary the following day. And he showed me, he said, um do you want to have a look at my notes for the game? And he showed me the notes he was making. This was his final commentary of a major finals. He'd done World Cup finals, European Championship finals, FA Cup finals, League Cup finals. The guy was a legend. And his notes were as diligent as the day he started. He went to the stadium the day before. He sat in the position and had a look at where he was going to commentate from which is what he would have done 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 times before. At no point did he think to himself, I'm going to take my foot off the gas and just chill out here. Um, my hero, Des Lynham, everyone goes, oh, Des Lynham was brilliant because he just came out with these amazing one-liners all the time. The only reason Des Lynham was able to come out with those brilliant one-liners was because he prepared and he planned them and he knew what he was doing and he was doing his research and he was doing his prep. And particularly as a sports broadcaster, for all of you guys who are watching this, who are writing blogs and you want to get into TV and you'd love to do what I do one day, well, the first thing is, right, someone has to do it. So there's no reason why it couldn't be you. Why can't you be the person who's introducing the 2025 FA Cup final? Why can't you be hosting Champions League or Premier League matches? Why can't you be interviewing Jensen Button winning the World Championship, right? This is the deal. I'm a guy from a small village in Norwich. My dad worked for Age Concern. My mum was a teacher, my uncle's a farmer, my granddad's a policeman. No TV contacts, no nepotism, no great uncles or great aunts or cousins or mates who worked in TV. Nothing. It literally had to come from scratch. And along the way, knock after knock after knock. I remember when I decided I want to get into TV and I came down to London and I was having meetings and interviews with people. And every time there was an audition, I applied for the audition and I wanted to get involved. And the one job I really wanted to, was to present the bigger breakfast. Do you remember that? So they had the big breakfast on Channel 4, then the bigger breakfast was what they had during the holidays. And I got an audition for the bigger breakfast. And it was the one I wanted. And I went down to the house and I sat in a chair where Johnny Vaughan sat because he was one of my heroes. I used to record the big breakfast at school, get home and then watch it on VHS at the end of the day. So I remember walking along. And I already had, and I kid you not, maybe a hundred rejection letters, maybe more, from either sending my showreel to people, which is like a five minute video of the best of my stuff, either a reje rejection letter through that way, a meeting and then a rejection letter, or at the very worst, um, a screen test where you go in and you sit down and they film what's going on and you do your best stuff and they get you to read a script or whatever, and then you get the rejection letter after that. Um, the Bigger Breakfast was the one that I wanted, I remember. Walking through London, my mum rang, she said, oh, I've got a letter and it's got the Big Breakfast logo on it. The banging is my wife, by the way, washing up downstairs. And, um, and I said, oh, can you open it, can you open it? And she said, are you sure? I said, yeah, open it, open it. So she opened this letter from the Big Breakfast. And it was basically, thanks for showing interest in the Bigger Breakfast, but it's not happening. You haven't got a job. And it went into a file along with all the other rejection letters. That was the one that really hit me. I just thought, maybe this isn't worth it. I was living on a mate's floor. I was 20, 21 years old. I really wanted to do it, but I just thought it would never happen. And do you know what? I've still got that folder. I got down to the last four for Blue Peter when Simon Thomas got the job, and I remember getting the letter telling me that I hadn't got that job either. And that hurt. But the most important thing in all those times is you need self-belief. Right, and it doesn't matter whether I'm on kids telly or whether I got the job in Formula One or whether I'm doing live Premier League for BT Sport. On an almost daily basis, I will speak to my bosses and they will give me feedback. And it's critical feedback. Because what's the point in telling people that they're good? The whole point about doing a job like mine is that you want to be better all the time. So I'm always saying to people, what can I do better? What can I do differently? How could I have done that better or that better? 
and you have to be able to take criticism and it's something that a lot of presenters that I've worked with and that I know really struggle with but I love it I love that sort of criticism because it's the only way to make you better David Coulthard was great at it on the Formula One and he said you know what's the point only discussing the stuff we do well why sit in a room and have a meeting and say that was good and that was good and that was good what's the point in that how are we going to improve if we do that and you've got to have a thick skin to do my job um, social media is an interesting one um, I'm sure there are a few of you on here that follow me on Twitter right, I get two or three hundred tweets telling me that I'm crap and I'm an idiot and I'm lanky and I'm ugly you know, I'm fat and I shouldn't be doing my job and I'm a waste of space and, and I'm rubbish every single time I'm on the television the one that really annoys me is the one where people say that I'm smug You'll never meet a less smug bloke. I mean, I'm just like, I'm just sort of lucky, really. You know, I love my job. I love my little girl. I love my wife. I love the baby in her tummy that's not yet born and my family. And I feel really lucky to do this job. Really lucky. And I realise how fortunate I am. Um, but there's no smugness. And I think it's just because people assume if you've ended up on the telly, chatting to footballers, standing pitch side at a Premier League match or an FA Cup final, you must be smug because how great is your life? But I'm well aware that tomorrow this whole thing could melt away, and that's another thing. If you're going to end up in TV, it could all melt away tomorrow. You've got to be aware of that at all times. Don't think that it's going to last forever. Um, and I think also that gives you some good self-preservation. Like I, Before I go on air, every single time, every time, I had it two days ago, when I was presenting the FA Cup semi-final, Aston Villa against Liverpool, I thought this is going to be the one where it all goes wrong for me. This is going to be the disaster. This is going to be the one I'm found out. And I get the night before, the morning of it, the hour before, mega, mega nervous. Because I think this is the one where it could go wrong. This is the disaster. And that's good, I think, because it's self-preservation. I think it leaves me in a position where I give it my all every single time. And I remember years and years ago, Richard Bacon saying, you're only as good as your last show. And it's true, there's no point me doing a brilliant football match six months ago and being crap ever since. I've got to be good every time. Um, so you've got to deal with pressure, because there is pressure. I mean, our football coverage, you know, we, you all know BT and Sky pay tens of millions of pounds for the coverage. I think it's about £7 million per game and it rests on your shoulders. And there's a whole team of people around you. There's producers and directors and PAs and researchers and all of them work so hard. But if you stand in front of the camera and mess up your opening link or don't know what you're saying or get the name of a player wrong, that overshadows the whole programme. So there is constant pressure to do a good job. And you'd have to do a good job for yourself and for all the people working around you as well in TV. But if you want it to happen... It can and it will. That's the most important bit of advice I can give you on this Periscope. If you want to do your dream job, whether it's a dancer, whether it's a sports broadcaster, whether it's a politician, you can make it happen. There's no reason why you can't make it happen. There's nothing in my life that was a favour. There's no strange anomaly that meant I ended up where I ended up. It was graft and it was hard work. And it's just as hard work today. Um, and even now I think I'm crap at my job. I worry every night that I'm rubbish. I ring my wife straight afterwards and go, oh, this was rubbish, that was rubbish. But maybe that's a good thing. Right, so let me sign off by just giving you my main bits of advice. Right, if you want, I can only really speak from personal experience as a sports broadcaster. Number one, write loads of stuff. I write all my scripts. I write everything I say on the TV. There's no auto cue on our football coverage. There's no writer. There's no person to tell me what I should be saying. It's entirely up to me. On the night before, when everyone else goes out and has dinner and has a few drinks, I go to my room and I write the whole script. You will have to write loads of stuff. And you've got to make it different to everybody else. Because if your writing isn't different or better, why won't they give that person a job? You've got to be brilliant. That's the first thing. Write a lot. Second thing, get some work experience. That was what made it for me, some work experience. But don't aim for work experience on match of the day with Gary Lineker or coming to BT Sport and coming to a Premier League game with us. The work experience you need to aim for is a local newspaper or a local radio station or um, local hospital radio. Just get hours under your belt. Do all of that stuff. 
take every opportunity, um, write loads of letters to people, watch your favourite TV shows, and at the end of the show, see the name of the person, the last name to appear, write to that person and tell them that you'd love a job. I think it's really important that people in TV help people that want to get into TV. It's the only way to keep the industry fresh, so make sure that you write to people and you might find a nice person, they might take you under your wing and you might get the opportunity. The next thing is you need to have self-belief, because if things just start to happen for you, there'll be people that tell you you're no good, um, that always happens. There will be moments where just you think you're going to get something amazing and it doesn't happen. So you need self-belief to stick to that. Um, the number one tip is hard work. Whether it's day one when I started on Children's BBC or whether it's the FA Cup semi-final I did yesterday actually. I've worked just as hard on both of them. So hard work is absolutely critical to making sure that you're going to do a good job. Um, and I think finally just be a nice person. I'm a big believer in karma give out good stuff and good stuff will come back to you be a nasty snide negative bitchy sort of person and i think that probably comes back to you as well so just be a good person um and those are probably my top bits of advice really but as i say there's no reason why it can't be you so if you really want it you really dream of it go out there and get it um that's about it it's not easy and it will never be easy, but someone has to do it. Make it you.